before that. <laughs> a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The Lord had blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Praise God. Um, I'd like us to go ahead and pray. And once you settle, as you're settling, I would like to make some acknowledgments and then we'll go straight and minister God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to share your most holy word. And thank you for your gracious presence here and the reminder that, that your glory is, is here and that you are ministering to the lives of your people. We thank you for the destiny that you have for every single individual and every family here today. We ask that you will continue to minister to the needs of your beloved children. We seek these mercies through Jesus our Lord and our Savior with thanksgiving. Amen. You may kindly be seated. Uh, just before we share God's word, let me just acknowledge uh, two servants of the Lord who were uh, mentioned a little earlier. Uh, they are precious servants of the Lord who are ministers within our Pentecostal Assemblies of God, Zambia. So I'll ask both of them to stand again. Uh, indeed, we have uh, Reverend Brian Changwe. Uh, wave your hand. Who is coming to us all the way from Kasama. He pastors Mount Zion Assembly there, one of the assemblies in Kasama. And he's here, I know, on uh, some work in the body of Christ as the, the Christ for All Nations ministry is preparing for the next wave of crusades. And he's one of the crusade directors. Having worked so hard in Kasama, they asked him to come and be part of the team of um, uh, crusade directors that are being prepared for another 10 crusades in the country. We're proud of you. Thank you very much. Amen. Um, then we have uh, Reverend Yangsen Yurenda. Reverend Yangsen Yurenda is ministering uh, in Nampundwe. Uh, we have a, a thriving church in Nampundwe. And uh, we're, we're so grateful to see what God is doing uh, through your life and your family. And hopefully we'll come there soon. Uh, and we, we are very delighted. But thank you very much for coming here today. And, and this is part of what God has blessed us with in this country. We have churches everywhere. And when you are in those locations, look out for one of our churches. And this is one of those vast growing and thriving impactful churches in the Nampundwe mining area. And we're very, very, very delighted. God bless you. <laughs> Praise God. Um, so today, as we get into God's word, we are keeping in mind that um, there are a number of young people who are returning to school. So I pray that I'll be reminded at the end we'd like to pray for a number. Uh, but I also... Um, I will be asking us to focus a little bit on the activities for the month of February. And I ask, I'm sure that our team there will flash uh, the summary of those from, as an extract from our church calendar. Uh, but just now, let's turn to the word. We have read from uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 15, uh, what we have to to, set to, to seven, actually, excuse me, but we will pr proceed a little later into the 15th verse. Um, what we have today is a focus on uh, the third segment of, of growth, which is numerical. And so uh, looking at preparing for and, and managing numerical growth. Uh, we have considered the foundations of discipleship so far since we began our look at the theme for the year. And we've looked at the roots, we've looked at the relationships, we've looked at growth itself. In considering growth, we have specified that um, discipleship is God's engine for transformation and growth. Now, that's a theory. 
the something we see in the word. And it's, it's clear in the narrative of scripture. Uh, by the way, Elder, uh, that also means we'll be praying for Sharon as well, who is going to Israel. So just maybe you are the one who must remind me about praying for those who are going away to school. So we have said discipleship is God's engine for transformation and growth. And we've been seeing that in Acts chapter 9. Uh, we've, we've seen that in Acts chapter 11. And we have examined three aspects of growth. Um, one, rather two of three aspects of growth. One, we've looked at the spiritual. And when we looked at the spiritual, we reminded ourselves over the fact that um, uh, the work of growth in our lives is a distinctive work of the Holy Spirit. And that's easier said than done. But we've said it's a distinctive work of the Holy Spirit which in ordinary uh, arrangements should become visible. We should actually see that. And when God's grace becomes visible to that extent, there is impact that's happening in the church and outside. Then we were considering institutional growth last week and emphasizing the fact that there is need for us to remember that God's church is an organism before it is an organization. A very important spiritual principle. So we're ready today to begin to look at numerical growth. And there are so many angles from which we can tackle this. But the Lord directed me towards three ways that we can pick out from Acts chapter 6 to prepare for and to manage numerical growth when the numbers increase. We're preparing to take the sanctuary down at some point soon and we're preparing for numerical growth in so many ways. But we must be able to remember a number of key things that happened. And today we have a few lessons from Acts chapter 6. So verse number 1 says, In those days, the number, that's numerics, the number of disciples was increasing. And then there's a specification, the Hellenistic Jews among them, meaning among themselves. So this was one grouping in the church. Culturally, they were all from the Jewish um, heritage. Some are identified as Hellenistic Jews. The others are identified as Hebraic Jews. Clearly, if you understand history, the Hellenistic Jews are those who had Jewish roots, yes, but they grew most likely in the diaspora among non-Jews. And mainly in this case, among Greeks. So you find that some of them actually ended up carrying Greek names. And we see an example of that when we see the listing of those who are chosen to administer something. The Hebraic, of course, were obviously the more um, naturally to be understood as those who spoke uh, what was known then as um, uh, Palestinian Aramaic. That was the language of the day. So these were their roots, and this is the language they spoke. But clearly, these are people who had been identified this way because they, they stuck close to their Jewish roots. So in one sense, they were like this uh, mini homogeneous group, even though there was this slight diversity. So within them, the Bible says, among them, there was supposed to be 
serious cohesion here. Because there were people who were from what you might consider one, one ethnic uh, setting. There was supposed to be peace. There was supposed to be harmony. Because they were all Jews. But the Bible says they complained among them. So that was something happening internal. That leads me today to deal with the first of three things that we must look out for as we think about and experience numerical growth. Number one, look out for growing pains. What I refer to as teething problems. The term teething problems is, is, is very common to, to us in our society. Parents understand when a baby is beginning to, uh, to grow teeth. And when they are pushing in the background and trying to make their way through the gums, it becomes a very significant time. Uh, we've been watching some of that in just the past few weeks as proud grandparents. A little baby whose teeth are trying to push through those gums loses appetite. And they will go for things that are in, within their reach. They will pick them up and some of those things may, may have germs and bacteria. If you leave them alone, they might pick a shoe. They will pick anything that's there. But imagine that going to the mouth and what it will cause. What it is that because of the irritation, they want something that will soothe. And so mothers here will pick up Ashton powder. Do we have any mothers in the house? I see them smiling and waving. <laughs> to soothe. But when a baby is in that state, they're also easily irritable. I can tell you that after 41 years of pastoring, I have seen some teething problems in the church. Okay, now somebody's finishing up for me in adults, not in babies. Deacon <laughs> uh, Angelus, you'll be in trouble. You are the one who said it. He says in adults. And those things happen as the family grows. There are times in the church when even what shouldn't irritate us, irritates us. Rightly or not rightly. But that happens. And it becomes important for us to make sure that when those symptoms are happening, we don't just treat symptoms. We must learn ways of managing that irritability, if you will. There's such a thing. And I see over these many years of, of pastoring that we are most times quite unprepared. So that the growing pain sometimes cause more pain in the church cause more hurt when in fact those pains should be managed because they are part of growth. Uh, doctors and uh, psychologists will tell you that um, these processes that are part of our growth within how God has created and made the body just need to be managed. So imagine, I, I remember us being uh, first time parents and many times panicking with, with the, 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 the slightest increase in temperature of the baby you're wondering is she still breathing <laughs> that's normal but you see with the help of those who had gone before 
you get to understand that this is something that you have to manage. And, and I want this church to learn from the scriptures. Because in the church where we have relationships, and we've just been dealing with relationships, we have to learn to manage one another as maturely as possible. Some things that divide us are just simple growing pains that become so unmanageable. Like I was saying last week, some say, ah, you imagine I end up. Well, me, I won't go to the, to, the, uh, to the life group anymore. And it is just a little thing where somebody even just forgot to acknowledge you. Does it happen? Yes, it does. I was saying in the second service, this is something I've mentioned here before. Sometimes you come on a Sunday like this. You pick your spot. You find parking. You come in good time. Pick your spot. Turn the car around. And park. In reverse. Because you're ready that once the benediction is done and we say Amen. Why? Because three Sundays ago, you were hoping somebody would take note of you, and they didn't. See, the numbers sometimes blind us all. On Sunday after church, in these numbers, you're out there, and I want to remind especially those of you who are older and longer, and, um, and you know many people at church, I want to ask you why you're always going only to the people that you know. Because that, that action may be the one that caused this person I'm describing here three weeks before to feel that you're always going only to the people in jackets and suits and people who are looking well clad and you don't really recognize those that don't appear uh, familiar to you. So that person looks around and says, ah, you know, it's better to go to a small church where they can acknowledge you, where your services matter. But somebody has caused that to some extent. I'm not excusing the action, but somebody has caused that because those of us who are familiar we are always going to those we are familiar with. And today I want to look out. I want you to look out. Because these numbers blind us on Sunday. We must look out for those who are needing attention. So, let me come back to this person. So you know I'm for you. But what you do is not okay. Because of that thing that happened three weeks ago, you now are ready that after church, because they have ignored you, once the benediction is done, because you want that blessing, the moment the bishop says, in Jesus' name, amen. Pa! The car is started, and you go. I want you to manage those growing pains. That's, that's a teething problem. It comes as a result of when we are so many and it appears as if some are neglected. Now, the Bible here is not saying that there was a report that maybe they were neglected. The Bible actually states factually that there was an overlooking. They were neglected. So sometimes there is clear negligence among us of each other's needs. Because we are overwhelmed by the numbers. And the sooner we acknowledge that, the better. Hello? Praise God. I said the sooner we acknowledge that, the better. So there was a section of the church that felt that their needs were unmet. I am sure that we have some among us. And this is not time 
for excuses. When there is a problem, we must address it. When there are growing pains, we must recognize them and... Okay. See? This is what happens. I didn't even see. It's just been fixed. So let's fix these issues. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we, we actually forgot to announce. Mr. Lungu is a happy father of a baby boy. As of last, last Sunday, isn't it? The other Sunday. Last Sunday, last Sunday, as of last Sunday. The name of the baby is Joshua. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it had nothing to do with us. <laughs> There's nothing to do with us. But anyway, that's there. Yeah. Congratulations, Mr. Lungu. Two girls. And he's been wanting, they've been wanting a boy. So he was told now he's a man. I don't know what that means. Uh, all right. Teething problems. <laughs> so, but I want us to come back to the reality, beloved. There are teething problems that we must address. And some of those have to do with unmet needs. Now, if a young parent, if a young couple who are first-time parents do not manage, the fact that the child is teething is normal, there are things that young parents must do to manage that baby during that teething phase. Like I told you, that's when we learned about Ashton powder. We learned uh, uh, a number of, of, of quick fixes here and there that would enable the baby to settle. And then they're losing appetite. So thankfully, if they are, they are breastfeeding, you know that they will continue to have a little bit of food, but you have to work harder now to get them to eat because it's becoming more uncomfortable for them to chew. So you and I must have that sense of seeing that we are responsible over one another and no one among us must ever feel overlooked, neglected, not noticed. And the fact that that happens means there is something that we're not doing okay. But you know, as a people, we want the numbers. We want to grow. We are glad when new people come. We make them stand. We clap. We welcome them. But it can't end at just saying, you're welcome, and they get asleep. They must feel that welcome by us walking up to them. And I saw you standing at the, in the church. So you're here for the first time. What's your name? I know there are formalities that leaders do. We attend to them. We, we promise to call them and we reach out to them. But this is not just for the top brass. It is for all of us. And we disciples. And yet we will go around sometimes and even say, you know, here, people don't care. You see, people just leave. People here don't care. Who are these people who don't care? And you're not among them? Looking out for one another is a responsibility of all of us. Even though, as you will see here shortly, some of the task was given to specific people. But we all have that responsibility over one another. So, if we've lost appetite for new people, and we just want to keep, we only have an appetite for those we know. We must repent from that in the name of Jesus. 
Today, today, try and reach out to someone you have not talked to maybe in the past so many weeks. But better still, somebody you have never talked to. Did you hear me? Somebody you have never, because they are here. You are in church with them, but you have never talked to them. I want to know why, and God wants to know why. Do you think that's true? That God wants to know why? Yes. Because we are disciples together. May God grow your appetite properly for meeting the needs of others in the name of Jesus. This is a light one. And it's just a pointer. Take note of verse number one. They were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Meaning in the normal course of something that was routine. And coming to church on Sunday and greeting people at the end of the service is routine. But when we are deriving satisfaction out of going to the same people, we will, in fact, some of you, some of the people you talk to here at church, you live in the same neighborhood. Come on, you will meet. <sighs> you will meet at the life group tomorrow. You still want to talk here. No, save this time for somebody else. All right, I'm going to do something very strange just now. May I ask everybody to stand? I want you to look around the church for a while. Can you pick out somebody you don't know? I mean, I'm, and I'm serious, just now. Pick out somebody you don't know. I'm, I'm giving three minutes for you to walk up to them. And ask for their name. I will come to you. Somebody you don't know. All right. All right. All right. I just check it. Is everything okay? Huh? Okay. Oh, it has fallen off. Okay. Maybe you can make another one and come and put it. You can make another one. All right. All right. Please, please be seated. <laughs> please be seated. Longo, please come here. Digon Simonza, please come. Dickness Joy, please come here. How many of you know her? Yes. How many of you know her? I want to see a show of hands. How many of you know her? It's like everybody here. How many of you know him? Okay, of course I said his name. <laughs> How many of you know him? All right. So, Deacon Smonza, who did you talk to? Who did you meet in the last few minutes? Mr. Banda and Ms. Banda. Okay. Okay. You, you didn't know them before. Just get the mic quickly. Just... <laughs> 
uh, behind you. No, 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 these ones. These ones. Yeah, these ones. All right. All right. So did you learn something about them in those two minutes? Uh, no, I didn't. But you found out their but name? I found out their name. Did you find out where they live? No. All right. <laughs> but at least you now know. You know them. Yes. You've never talked to them before? Never talked to them before. Mr. and Mrs. Banda, how long have you been coming to church? Uh, let, please stand. You're famous today. You're very famous today. How long have you been coming to church? How long have you been coming to church? And the deacon. <laughs> and the deacon didn't know your name. How does it make you feel now that the deacon knows your name? It's good, eh? All right, a big hand for Mr. and Mrs. Band. <laughs> sorry, sorry, car black. No, no, it's it okay. happens. I think I deserve that one. To the best of us. <laughs> All right, long go. Who did you meet? I uh, met three people. Okay. There's Milda right behind me. The, uh, those who are being uh, mentioned, please stand. Oh, Look, this is an important right. exercise. Yes. Who, who did you meet? Milda. Milda, so okay. she lives just within North Mid. All right. Uh, then there's Mr. Chiza. Uh, I hope I got the name correctly pronounced. Chiza. Mm -hmm. And then there's Dylan. Who? Dylan? D Dylan? Dylan. Dylan. Okay. Yes. Dylan, how long have you been coming to church? Three years now? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Actually. Okay. <laughs> and Milda, how long have you been coming to church? Six months now. You're very welcome. And of course, Mr. Chiza, we know, has been coming to church for a long time. But you only knew them today. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. A big hand for those ones. <laughs> Dickness Joy. <laughs> Who did you meet? Bishop. <laughs> Why elders fought... Lady Patricia's foot. They were blocking me. They were blocking. Oh. So by the time I got to try and see someone, oh, you I didn't. Know. I couldn't. Oh, you couldn't. Okay. All right. No, that's excusable. But, but now I, I, I will you will do something pray. at the end of a service. Amen. <laughs> a big hand for these ones. All right. Thank you. You, you may be seated, beloved. I just want us to be real. Church is, is not something that we must turn into a place where we just come and go. When we read the word, it is very clear that this is a place where destinies are formed. And that it is a family. We were teaching last week about body relationships. And we were showing how every single one of us has a role. And I emphasized more in the second service than I did in, this, in the first. The fact that we are serious with relationships here. So serious that if you walk away blaming everybody that they didn't look after your need. Well, that may be true. When you walk away because you feel your need was unmet and you are a believer. My reading from scripture is that you, you also are doing something wrong. Because... When we call ourselves a family, we ought to interact. And where we see a problem, we must be part of the solution. So last week, in the second service, I made a given example of somebody who maybe comes to church and they have no milly meal. They walk here hoping someone will guess they have no milly meal at home. They lay a bait and say, let's see if they will talk to me. And unfortunately, it might be one of those Sundays where, again, we're so consumed in 
just ourselves, and so we end up not talking to that person. The person is disappointed and walks away. We've committed a wrong. But if they are a believer, I am saying, I don't expect you to walk away. If you are part of the family, you must open the conversation with someone and say, you know what? I'm seeing everybody leaving here, but I have a need at home. I have no mealy meal. We expect you to feel sufficiently connected to the family that you can tell someone your need. Other than the fact that God does give us discerning ability and sometimes we can sense need, is not always. Sometimes you have to actually know what's existing. So I'm challenging us. For those of us who always walk away and drive away because somebody didn't talk to us, that you also take the time to correct what's wrong by saying, actually, you know, I'm seeing everybody going away. I have a problem at home. And share that need. If you share that need and we say, sorry, we can't help you, then we are sinners. And we are failing in our responsibilities. A normal church should embrace those who share need. And we must be able to meet each other's needs. So I want to remind us that in this arrangement of our quest for numerical growth, let us prepare for the growing pains to the extent that we become conversational enough and relational enough and create an atmosphere where the person that has need will feel the liberty to open up and say, I have a need. So that's how we close and balance that equation. We're serious about church here. This is not a social organization. Yeah, there are social things we do, but this is the body of Christ. And when we prepare for numerical growth, we're talking about not just numbers, we're talking about people who have needs. May you be the answer to that need. So put it this way. You do the one act that will cause somebody to feel when they were losing appetite to begin to have the appetite to do something for God. And God will bless you. Alright, I want to move quickly to the second item today. This is now corporate in the sense that it calls on us as leaders but it also calls on us as a corporate, entity, a corporate entity, as a church. And this is what I see in the scriptures. As we prepare for numerical growth, we need to create systems that are responsive. The systems must be responsive to manage the growth. The aim of these systems must be to actually manage the diverse needs that are in the body. There's a diversity here that we must be conscious of. And to manage that diversity, this organism needs a serious level of systematic organization and management. Now, maintaining that balance in the church, I'll come back to this, is very, very very challenging. Sometimes we overdo it on the systems and we forget the spiritual. But sometimes we're all on this spiritual path, but we're not really working hard enough on a systematic way of making sure that we are attending to needs and managing them in a traceable manner. So let me show you here in verse number two. The Bible says, Number two. So, this is a response to growth. The 12, so they have to be those who see the need and help to gather. So, the 12, this is a top layer of leadership that refers to us, some of us, and, and the facilitatory roles that we occupy. So the 12 gathered 
gathered who? Oh, the disciples. We're talking about the foundations of discipleship here. And I want you to see how the scriptures are so clear in the New Testament in describing the gathering of the believers as a gathering of disciples. Let's never forget that. These are disciples. These ones I called here, some of them carry titles, but they are disciples. So they gathered all of them together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. The routine of, of the daily meeting of social needs that was going on. Meaning they had a system. So sometimes people may fail to respond, maybe share, maybe because they can't really see where to get in in the system. And I want to talk about the systems we have here on a generality. In managing growth in the community, we've put together life groups. That's a system. It's a system for managing the believer's growth in the community. The believer's engagement. So, if you consider yourself part and parcel of the assembly, then find your place systematically in the life group. And we have said, in the life group, people will know you. So, I'm now coming back to those who sometimes in the numbers on Sunday may feel drowned. But in a smaller group, people will know your name. They will know your name. So you can't just say, no, me just on Sunday. And in the past, we've even talked about those of you who are engaged in ministry, uh, whether in music and so on, and say, no, I go to church, to, I mean, choir, I do this and so on. I can't be in the live group. No, 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 no. You must. In fact, it's a precondition for you to do ministry. Because that's where your life is channeled. But sometimes, even the systems that we create become a bit inoperational. Sometimes they ail. We, mu we must treat that and make sure that our systems are responsive enough to meet the needs of God's people. Now, that is a task for us at the leadership level, for people at operational level. It's a task for all of us. And so they... They created a system here. They called them together and said, you know what? We can't all just be complaining. Let us choose some from among us who can systematically identify the needs of everybody in the community and also attend now to those who are being neglected. And when you read the list of the seven they chose, all of them, were from the group that was actually complaining. Because they all have uh, Hellenic names. So let's read. The proposals pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And also Philip, Prochorus, Nekano, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. All these are Hellenic names. So which means they, they systematically observe that for acceptability, they, they should pick these people from among them so they don't feel like anybody else is overlooking them because they are their own. It was a system to manage that particular growth spirit, if you will. And we must have confidence in the systems we set up for ourselves. Hallelujah. And so, I want to take us a little further. The needs here were social. Some of them were forced on these people because of their economic status. There must be a relevance in the things we do. 
uh, elder, when we were doing the week of prayer, during, on the day that you led us in prayer, you talked about social economic discipleship and how we, we must be able to look at each other in the church. How many are actually engaged? How many are unemployed? What can we do to help? We must simply facilitate. How can we reach out to one another? We can meet needs up to a certain point, but sometimes there's to, to resolve the issue is not just about meeting that need and giving 100 kwacha, 200 kwacha, 300 kwacha, 500 kwacha. The better issue might be, what else can we do to help you? So we create a platform for meeting those needs. And as a church here, we've been engaged in this area for so many years. We've created employment in this country. By running schools. In just the past few years, we've created over 250 jobs in the various projects that we are running. But now, when you talk about our work, for instance, in the community, and we need to share more with the church, through, for instance, the circle of hope, running over 40 outlets here in the city, and now going to another 52 outside in the provinces. There are people, some people here, some of you have recently gotten jobs through this ministry of the church. We are contributing to the society. But then there are those who may not be able to have those jobs. We must still create room for them to find ways of feigning for themselves, bringing an income into the family, and then also contributing to the church and the running of the ministry. Hallelujah. That's managing the diversity of needs. But I want us to go to Titus chapter 2 and to look at the relevance of the generational needs that were being met. Titus chapter 2. And we'll go to something very, very important there. From verse number one. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. So we're talking about age appropriate uh, things here. Let's carry on. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach older women. So two groups are mentioned there. These are generational groups showing the diversity in the church. So older men. Now we are reading older women. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers and uh, addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Let's carry on further. Then they can urge the younger women. Ah, there's another layer there. They can, they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled and pure. To be busy at home. To be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. It's not all. Let's carry on. Similarly, teach the young men. So we're seeing four layers there. They are older men, 
older women, younger women, younger men. In meeting the needs of persons in the church, there must be a generational relevance. And that is what we're focusing on this year. It can't just be one end. And I'm glad that the Beckys of this time, like Becky did today, can feel the liberty to talk about how God is touching them. These are young people. Becky is how old? 13? How old are you, Becky? 13? 14. All right. So a 14-year-old in the church must feel that their needs are being met. And a 60, 70-year-old or 80-year-old must feel that their needs are being met. Now, that's challenging. But the church is set up in such a way as an organism that it, is, it must need, meet needs that are generation, it must be generationally relevant in its ministry so that these needs are adequately met. To do that, it means that each one of you at your level must find what you need to do because the generations are represented by all of us who are here. Hello? So, what we have observed, and we observed it not just here, I've observed that in the very many locations that we've been through in our pastoral ministry, that young people get married. Once people get married, somehow it appears as if their level of engagement in the ministry sort of dissipates. Have you seen that here? Why is that? So you're giving us the idea you were just looking for marriage. <laughs> you were alone, now you have a partner. You should be able to do more in the ministry. Amen. I like this side. And here too, right? All right, maybe I like this side too. <laughs> and that is notwithstanding that we have a marriage ministry in place. So where are you? What are you doing? What is it that you do now that makes you feel... It is now time to step back. The Bible says two are better than one. Show us that two are better than one. Show us. So, there is sufficient generational diversity to adequately meet the generational needs within the church. But why those gaps exist is because we are not doing what we ought to be doing. And that's not the way to prepare for numerical growth. So we, when we think about systems, remember, you are part of the system. You are part of God's architecture for growing the church. You and I are part of God's architecture. I mean, need I go back? To 1 Corinthians 12 that we read last Sunday. The one is an eye, one is an ear. The ear cannot say to the eye, I don't need you. One is a foot. The whole body works. Each one doing their part. And may you find that place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we are seeing here. So let's go back to that slide. Slide number six, quickly, and then I'll go to the last part. So we said, number one, we must be able to look out for growing parents. Number two, we must create 
responsive systems for managing growth. And I'm saying we can grow these, we can do these systems at corporate level, in the way we run, in administration and all those areas, and that, that's a given. But I want to think more organically also about the systems that actually manage those needs. And that diversity of needs has to do with as many as we are. And don't you ever think there are certain people to do this. I'm emphasizing we are all part of God's architecture of growth in the body. Hallelujah. All of us. I pray that you will be part of the solution. This is a year, beloved, for doing that because we are visiting the foundation of discipleship. Amen. Lastly, lastly, what I'm pointing at here is very obvious stuff. Titus chapter 2 is one of our four key scriptures for uh, emphasis in our theme as, as a fellowship. And we've just looked at it, showing the generational diversity in the church. I remind you and I that um, as we deal with this third thing, which is the need to retain focus on spiritual foundations, that's the third way we prepare for growth. The need to return a focus on spiritual foundations. I remind you that we said um, to understand the church as an institution, we already mentioned one must understand the church as an organism. We emphasize that. Those are the scriptures we referred to last week. And we talked about the relational base. That's a given. But I want to go a little further. And now examine this aspect of spiritual foundations. Like I said, it's a delicate balance. Sometimes we overdo it on the systems and we forget the spiritual. But we must have this delicate balance. And sometimes we are doing all this spiritual and we neglect the fact that God is the master at management and he wants us to manage growth and manage our issues, manage problems, find solutions. So we can't be living in some oblivious world. We must address issues. And that's what I'm talking about here. And I'm broadening the base for dealing with those issues by inviting you all to say that if you're part of the family, then you must be part of the solution. There must be joy in doing that. Hallelujah! So it shouldn't be this thing about a uh, panel, you know, these people, those people. No. If they are those people, you must be those people. Ah, no, you didn't hear me. If they are those people, you must be those people. So this is not a, way, a time for detaching. It's the time for connecting. Somebody shout hallelujah. So two things in this need for retention of the focus on spiritual foundations. Beloved, there is no substitute for prayer and the word. So when you look at verse number two, while they sat to create systems, systems didn't take over their spiritual endeavor. This is the worry we have in the church. And when you talk to brothers and sisters in the Western uh, Hemisphere, in Northern Hemisphere, the Western church, so to say. What they say to us, coming from Africa, is they say, you know, you people are fortunate because you still are witnessing the power of the Spirit. This is what our brothers say to us. They say that we, some, for, so, for those of us in, in, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, it looks like sometimes we become so materialistic. This is, what they, this is what they say. We become so materialistic, we rationalize everything, and sometimes we are so focused on just systems. And somebody said, you know, the Holy Spirit could leave us and we'll keep on functioning. And if that is what systems mean, that's not the system we are, we are talking about. No matter how good our systems are, if the Holy Spirit departs, our systems must fall, must fail to function, to remind us that we're going at it alone. 
But we're living in a day and time where the danger of trusting just what we have set up is so much that we could substitute our quest for excellence and systematic approaches towards life for the power of the Holy Spirit. And those two things don't work like that. There is no substitute. Yes, we are all for these good systems, but there is no substitute for prayer and the word. It's a balancing act that is very delicate. This week is a week of prayer. I was talking to Deaconess Joy just the other day. I was actually in the office, was meant to come in, and there was an emergency. And uh, so we let everybody run. So when everybody was coming out of the prayer meeting here, I could hear the, uh, um, the fellowship. I could hear from the fellowship. So as I was talking to Deaconess Joy, she said, no, Bishop, it's really wonderful. She was reporting on, on the prayer meeting and, and how uh, Deacon um, Mwila had, had led and, and just the powerful things that, that, that were going on. I said, no, I heard. I could tell from as I was on the phone, but I could tell from just the fellowship that was going on outside that something had happened in there. Let's keep those foundations of prayer. And there are people who are consistently, predictably able to be known that will be there on Friday evening as prayer goes on. No substitute. This week, first week of each month, is a week for prayer. Where we take one hour from six to seven praying here in the church. Every first month. How many of you will place that on your agenda now? We distilled this down now to just the first week after we had run for quite a while towards the end of the year. And the apostle said, we will not for the sake of these needs for which we will create a system, let the system run. But we must focus on prayer and the word. That's number one. Number two. I want you to note that if we do focus on prayer and the word, the second thing is supernaturally not the natural occurrence. And that is. So supernaturally natural, this thing will happen. That is, there will be supernatural impact that becomes part and parcel of a disciple's life when prayer is put in the right place and when the word is made central. So let's follow the life of one disciple before we close. He was one of the seven chosen. One of those seven chosen. His name is Stephen. He's the only one in the pile that is described as having met just like the others. Remember they had a criteria. And, uh, uh, and, and there is room. If we were just do, do teaching a management uh, class, I would have gone into some detail to show you how they set up criteria. They set up qualifications. So it's not just that in church we just speak anyhow. Ah, there, there are qualifications. They, they are prerequisites. They set up that criteria and so on. They say um, people who must be full of the Spirit, they must be known, so they must carry a testimony. So that's besides the point. But Stephen, he says concerning Stephen, as he fulfilled that, he was full of, a man full of God's grace and power. Stephen, a disciple. He performed great wonders and signs among the people. For the class that's doing Synoptic Gospels, I see that the question of miracles, where is Deaconess uh, uh, Okiro, Elizabeth, and, and uh, Dr. Nancy? We've had this conversation in, in, in the class on Synoptic Gospels. And by the way, there's a new cohort starting in March. We'll be 
announcing this coming week. Many more of you must take these courses because uh, there's so, much, uh, one, so many wonderful things happening, things happening. But the discussion began again on why don't we see as many miracles today as we see on the pages of the New Testament. And, and that discussion will carry on. But here is a man full of the Holy Spirit. And at his hand, the Lord performed wonders and signs among the people. Verse number nine. Opposition arose. However, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, the freedmen as it was called, and Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with who? With Stephen. So now we are seeing a disciple from the pack. Remember, he was part of the group that was meant to manage the issues there. But this person has taken his role. You are talking about us taking responsibility. He is a man who took responsibility. We don't hear about the others. We're hearing about Stephen. Look at what this new role provided for him. The gentleman is out of the four walls of the church. He's out there. This is what we desire for every one of you, beloved. For every one of you. Here, we prepare you to go into the marketplace to do the work of the Lord. Let's quickly follow Stephen. Verse number 11. Oh, verse 12, verse 10 itself. But they could not stand up against the wisdom and the spirit gave him, the wisdom the spirit gave him as he spoke. Let's carry on. Then they secretly persuaded some men, some men to say, we have heard Stephen. Speak blasphemous words. And uh, it's amazing. So they stirred up the people. And the elders. And the teachers of the law. These were terrible elders. Definitely different from our elders. They seized Stephen. And brought him before the Sanhedrin. So a conversation began. As they brought him before the Sanhedrin. And in the interest of time, uh, let me just narrate it. As they were there, people were asking, saying, what shall we do with him? And there was a man who rose up there. And he said to them, you know you people, let's go on to verse number 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. This is a disciple called Stephen. He was now not in the church. He was in the marketplace. And in the marketplace, they saw. This is what we're preparing you for, beloved. On Sunday here, I've told you what you need to do. But tomorrow, you're in the office. May people see your face shining. Because God's presence is in your life. Hallelujah. The Bible says his face was like the face of an angel. Shine, disciple. Shine. 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 The rest is history. When you read chapter 7, and Stephen is now carrying the testimony. Let me draw your attention towards chapter 57 for the wrap-up. In chapter 57, his impact, chapter 50, oh, verse 57, excuse me, thank you. Verse 54, actually not 57. Verse 54. In verse 54, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. He had now ministered, given the history and given a sermon that gave the, uh, the historical panoramic view of all that had happened. And then they had a question before then. They became furious. Verse 55, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven. You were talking about God's glory. You are talking about God's glory. The Bible says he looked up 
and he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus giving him a standing ovation. And he was on the right hand of God the Father that talks about acceptance. And this didn't prevent the people from stoning Stephen. They went ahead and stoned Stephen. And we read that he simply knelt down and prayed. Talk to God. Follow with me. Verse 56. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. Wow! So they descended on him. They dragged him out of the city and stoned him. But I want you to notice something as we are wrapping up. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats, the coats that they picked up from Stephen, at the feet of a young man named Saul. I want you to see the power of supernatural impact, which is what we want to believe God for. It's not just about talk and theory. And numbers and 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 these growth spits where you're always complaining. Get into the place where God's Holy Spirit can so fill you that when you leave this place today, the people who meet you can have an encounter with a disciple who has been in the presence of God, namely you. Hallelujah. Laid these things at the feet of Saul. Now we've talked a lot about Saul in the last few weeks. But I want you to see that with the descending and the revelation of that level of glory, with the appearance of Jesus in the heavens, there was no way. It was game on. This was like that goal you score in the, the equalizer that comes in extra time in, when there's only four minutes to go. And it was 1-0, then it's 1-1, one, one, and you hear the announcer saying, game on now. It was game on for Saul. My understanding is this, that Saul, the game had begun now. Because it was here when Saul, reeling from the impact of Stephen's life, as a disciple, not knowing what had touched him, he got up, got letters from the authorities, and now he was headed to Damascus to arrest the disciples. When you have had contact with the supernatural, there is no way you can escape the grip of God. And I see Saul heading towards Damascus. And on the Damascus road, at broad day time, with a noonday sunshine appearing right there, Saul meets the same Jesus that Stephen had seen standing up and welcoming him before the throne. The same Jesus, because Saul was a witness at the life of Stephen, the disciple. So I must even say, but may have participated in making sure that this disciple was killed. He was an organizer. And I want you to know that when we talk spiritual growth, yeah, there are principles, there are things we must do. Yes, yeah, systems must work. But this work of growth is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And it takes more than just a bishop. It takes more than the pastors. It takes more than the elders and deacons. It requires every disciple to return to the foundation of prayer and the word. And so there will be a result of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life.
the mind reading. He said, what you see in the life of Saul cannot be detached from the impact, the supernatural impact of a disciple named Stephen. And the supernatural things continue. We've been discussing them. Souls in Damascus, blind. We've been talking about that. God, the Holy Spirit, appears to Ananias. You see, what sustains the work of God is the Holy Spirit. By His power, He sustains His work. I want us to get back to the roots. If we're talking about foundations of discipleship, look at the linkage in the scriptures. Prayer and the word and systems must not take over, must not relieve, must not um, make irrelevant, must not dilute primacy of prayer and the word. As we build systems, let's make sure that they're growing on this important foundation. And today, there must be a disciple called Angelus. There must be a disciple called Alpha. There must be a disciple called Longo. There must be a disciple called Helen. There must be a disciple called Becky. There must be a disciple God Mildred, if that's your name. And I want us to prepare for that level of supernatural growth. God bless you, beloved. And thank you very much. I'll ask the choir to come. Let's rise. Well, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I want to call us back to that foundation. What God has been laying on my heart is to bring to us as a body the relevance of our body ministry. When I read the pages of the New Testament, I see that as the foundation of the church. The apostles, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, the prophets, they did their part. But I am amazed when I see on the pages of the New Testament people who would have easily been like non-entities emerge as powerful disciples. Stephen is one of those. You read about Philip. We've been reading about Paul. We've been reading about Ananias. Let heaven read about you. Let heaven read about you. And so in these few moments as we're closing, I ask you to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to prepare for growth, but remember that growth starts first with me. So we've talked about spiritual, we've talked about institutional. Today we've looked at numerical. And I've taught on numerical growth from a totally different angle because that's what the Lord was showing to me. And see yourself as part of God's architecture and part of that system. And say, Lord, since I'm part of your architecture and your system, and maybe this is a place to sing again the song that you said has been on your heart, where I'm, I'm, I, I realize I'm a child of God and I'm so glad that I am, that I'm free. Come, maybe let's do that right now. 
and make it part of our prayer today. And I'd like you, beloved, to realize God has a purpose for your life and He wants to use you. He wants to shine through your life like He did for Stephen. Some of you, your work takes you before very important people who may never for a long time step into church. But you have a chance. And they have a chance to meet you. And if your life is shining with Jesus, guess what? You'll have supernatural impact on those people. And someday they may come to church. But the, 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 the witness will have begun with you. With you. Some of them are your fellow contractors. Some of them are business partners. Some of them are your leaders. Some of you stand before our presidents, before ministers, before important decision makers globally. And when they meet you, let's ensure that they have met Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's ensure that they have met Jesus. Go ahead and lead us, and then we'll pray. Who am I that the highest king would welcome him? I was lost, but he brought me all oh, his love for me. All oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Who oh, is free. Oh, I'm a child of God. Yes, yes I Thank you, Jesus. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was in a world of sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Oh, the sun sets free. Yes, he's free I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, yes I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who He says I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who You say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who You say I am. Hallelujah. You are for. Not against me, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, who is free. Me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. There's a place. There is a place for you. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I say it again in my father's house. In my father's house. There's a place, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead and speak to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is a place for you. 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 Serebon Naramama. Rereba Sandaraba. Yerebo Tarabama. Saramama Mama 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 Sing. Ramos Sarababa. Mama Mo Sarab. Hallelujah. Mama. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, we're in God's presence. And every single one of you, this is a prayer you need to take with you. As you go home, there's a place for you. There is a place for you. You are a disciple. There is a place for you. And he's preparing you to have that supernatural impact out there as we prepare for numerical growth. But there might be one, or there might be more, who might be here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Before we close this service, I'd like to pray for you. Please raise your hand if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're saying, Bishop, I want to be born again. I want to be part of God's family. And I need prayer. If that's you, raise your right hand so we can see you. And we'll be ready to pray for you. Is there anybody here today who would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He loves you. You can become his child today and now. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We'll keep that invitation open. And if there are any that are watching remotely and you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior you also can receive him and what I would like you to do as I do a prayer shortly now is for you to follow that prayer inviting Jesus into your heart and then shortly after this we'll give you some instruction so if your desire is to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior to become born again then say these words as your own prayer after me dear Lord Jesus I come to you as a sinner I realize that I've gone away from your commandment today I've heard your voice speaking to me calling me back to you I acknowledge that I have sinned and I've come short of your glory therefore I confess my sins I ask you Jesus to come inside my heart forgive my sins be my Savior and my Lord and help me to live a holy life dear Lord I commit myself to you now help me to tell others about you so that they can experience what I have experienced in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you pray that prayer faithfully, the Lord has heard you. What we'd like you to do is be able to contact us using the platform that you use to join us, to join this service. And if you're here physically, then come towards the front and meet the leaders here at the front. And they'll guide you further as to what you need to do with your life. Thank you for joining this service. Let me invite now all the believers to just raise your hands towards heaven as we prepare for the affirmation and the benediction. Praise God. And with everything we've covered today, benediction should take on a new meaning. One, two, three. Because I'm a child of God and anointed by His Spirit, I have capacity, skills, and talent to fulfill my destiny. I have a Christ-like character. I have moved from good to great. 
I am connected to God and men. Therefore, I will fulfill my purpose for my generation because I'm an ark of righteousness planted by the Lord for the display of His splendor and glory. Hallelujah. Beloved, the Lord bless you, keep you, cover you, and protect you. The Lord go before you and grant you peace. The Lord turn His countenance towards you and the Lord be your rear guard. The Lord cover you. The Lord provide for you. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his great God and Father without spot or wrinkle. To him alone be glory, honor, power, strength and majesty, both now and evermore. Because we pray and ask in Jesus' holy name. And the redeemed of the Lord who are preparing for and are ready to manage numerical growth will agree together by saying, surely goodness, mercy and wholeness, identity and destiny shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will feast at the table spread for me as I fix my eyes on Jesus, the Lamb of God, the author and finisher of our faith, and our great apostle and high priest. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Can I have that slide? Uh, just a reminder. This is an extract from our calendar for the year. This month, this week, we have prayer beginning... Um, tomorrow running all week those to pray have already been assigned yes. um, and while I'm making these announcements Sharon and others who need prayer uh, the children that are going back to school please just walk to the front quickly we want to do that um, and take a mic and tell us what you're going to do in, uh, in Israel just before she does um, so there's prayer this week every morning at 6 uh, on the 12th we have a uh, special focus on young adults here and in the week 15th to 19th we already announced uh, Africa Arise and uh, those of you intending to travel may I ask uh, you're pointing at each other. Both of you stand. You can see those two people there. Uh, if you intend to travel, those of you in the MLT, we made a special appeal to you to consider this is a leadership outfit. Africa arise and you will be blessed. That is in Addis Ababa. And so please take note of that. And uh, MLT leaders are reminded of our quarterly meeting on the 25th. Just, just as an extract. All right. Tell us what you'll be doing. Good morning, church. Uh, I'll be going to Israel tomorrow. I'm going there for, an, for school, an internship for 11 months. All right. In what field? So uh, I'm at the University of Zambia. My major is animal science. So I'm going for agriculture. That's it. Praise God. Others who are leaving for school, so we can pray for you alongside Sharon. All right. Maybe they are gone already today. All right. Please extend your hand towards the front. Lord, we thank you for Sharon. We commend her now into your hands. We pray your grace to abound. And as a disciple, in that course, she will shine forth for you. And that she will be a witness to the others. In Jesus' holy name, we pray for special grace, supernatural impact, and preservation. And that she will come back with testimonies, knowing that you will have accomplished your task and your reason for taking her to Israel. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Bless you. I will be ushered from the back. Live groups tomorrow at uh, 18 hours. And thank you, choir. Please, a big hand for them. First time visitors, please come and meet our leaders here at the front.